All right, let's go with it then. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Ilyan Yotov, and I'm the uh, foreign exchange strategist at AllThingsForex.com. I'm also familiar to a lot of traders as the creator of the Forest Theory, and this is exactly what we're going to talk about in our webinar today, the Forest Theory and some of the methodologies there that are innovative uh, methods that I've created to uh, – assist currency traders with uh, recognizing some, some trend developments and price behavior patterns with foreign exchange rates. Now, I recently had a book published uh, by Wiley, John Wiley and Sons. It was uh, released in January this year. And those of you who are not familiar with it, you can check it out on my website, allthingsforex.com, or simply go to Websites like uh, all thing, uh, like um, Amazon.com, TradersLibrary.com, or your local Borders or Barnes and Noble stores. I'm the uh, founder of AllThingsForex.com. Perhaps many of you are familiar with the website, and also a uh, trading videos website called TradersTape, TraderTape.com. I'm also the host of a popular program. It's a daily broadcast. I call it the All Things Forex broadcast. You can check all of that on by going to www.allthingsforex.com. Now, a few months ago, we did a, an introduction webinar that introduced currency traders with the foundation of the quarter theory. And I explained uh, then what the mathematical foundation of the quarter theory is. It's a... Uh, Obvious is something that perhaps some of you have seen, but uh, if you're joining us today for the first time, I wanted to go through that for about five minutes or so. And uh, for those who are not familiar with the quarter steer, let me quickly explain what uh, the premise is, and then we'll go into some interesting things that uh, and some new methodologies that I have developed in order to recognize price behavior as well as some trend developments, and then how we can combine them together when they come together you will see uh, a big difference, I hope, as far as uh, making things uh, simple for traders to recognize and take advantage of some trend developments. Obviously, the, uh, the world uses the decimal numeral system. It is a positional numeral system. It has positions for units, 10, 100, et cetera. The position of each digit conveys the multiplier, which is a power of 10 always, to be used with that digit. Each position has a value of 10 times that of position to its right. That's small notation, familiar to everybody. Here's the example, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 9. Writing of numbers in a base 10 numeral system, which uses various symbols called digits, for 10 distinct values to represent numbers. Basic stuff, right? Here's the uh, real and whole numbers. Real numbers include counting numbers, integers, rational numbers, irrational numbers, and most importantly for the quarters theory, the so-called whole numbers. 0, 1, 2, 3, and so forth. When a trader takes a look at the, uh, at the table of whole numbers, and especially when we take a look at the first number in each row, I've focused on these numbers because they, they do have a significance, uh, in my opinion, even more than any other number in the table. Why is that? Well, the first number in each row represents a critical junction that marks the end of a previous set, and at the same time, the beginning of a new set of 10 numbers. So these are important junctions that uh, mark the end of a previous set and then at the same time, the beginning of a new set of 10 numbers. So what I call them, these numbers in the quarter theory, I give them the name major whole numbers. Examples of that would be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and so forth. In currency exchange rates, we represent them with uh, by using decimal whole numbers. With a decimal point, obviously, there, euro-dollar exchange rate, for example, dollar and 30 cents, dollar 31, dollar 32, and so forth. Example with the Aussie dollar, 0 0.80, 0 0.81, 0 0.82, 0 0.90. So what will be the major whole numbers if the currency exchange rates are represented with a decimal point. Well, obviously, the major decimal whole numbers will be dollar thirty, 
60. If you're looking, for example, at the exchange rate between the euro and the US dollar, if you're looking at the Aussie dollar exchange rate, be 0 0.60 cents, 0 0.70, 0 0.80, 0 0.90, then the parity level one for one, which obviously is a very important price level, and so forth. Through the currency decimalization, we know that one unit of the main currency has been divided into 100 subunits. For example, one euro or one dollar are divided into 100 cents. One Swiss franc is divided into 100 centimes. One pound is divided into 100 pence. But for even further precision, when it comes to currency exchange rates, even the subunits are divided into additional 100 subunits called price interest points or pips. So, one cent, for example, is divided into 100 additional subunits called price interest points, or pips. And with some currencies and exchange rates, the main unit is divided into 100 additional subunits. And that, for example, is the Japanese yen, where we have one yen divided into 100 pips. So what do I do with the quarter steer? I look at these major whole numbers. And when we think in terms of pips and pip ranges, between each one of these two decimal whole numbers, for example, with the euro dollar exchange rate, we'll have, let's say we have the whole numbers dollar thirty and a dollar forty cents. That is a distance of exactly ten cents, which is the subunits of the of one euro. Or, uh, of, right, one euro. When we divide the 10 cents and think in terms of pips, the 10 cents range would have 10 times 100, which is 1,000 pips. So between each one of the two major whole numbers, there will be constant price ranges of 1,000 pips. And in between the whole numbers, not the major ones, between each two whole numbers, whether that's $1.30, $1.31, $1.32, $1.33, within those 1,000 pip range, we're also going to see that we have constant price ranges of 100 pips each. So with the quarters theory, I divide all of these ranges into 100, into uh, four equal parts, or four quarters. Now, if we divide the large range, which is the 1,000 pip range, into four equal parts, then we get four large quarters of 250 pips each. When we divide the 100 pip ranges, then we get four equal parts or four small quarters of 25 pips each. And this is just a little example <clears throat> as to what the 1,000 pip range looks like in a 100 pip range between each one of the whole numbers. So what are the quarters? Well, exactly that. We divide the 1,000 pip range, <coughs> excuse me, into one, into four equal parts, or four large quarters of 250 pips each. So if we were to divide the 1,000 pip range between the major whole numbers at $1.30 and $1.40, then we'll get the large quarters between dollar thirty, dollar thirty two fifty, dollar thirty two fifty to dollar thirty five, dollar thirty five to dollar thirty seven fifty, dollar thirty seven fifty to dollar and forty cents. <coughs> now if we were to divide the one hundred pip ranges, for example, <coughs> excuse me, lots of coffee this morning. <coughs> if we divide the one hundred pip range between let's say dollar thirty and a dollar thirty one cents, then we'll get four equal parts or four small quarters of twenty five pips each. From dollar thirty to dollar thirty twenty five, dollar thirty twenty five to dollar thirty fifty, dollar thirty fifty to dollar thirty seventy five, dollar thirty seventy five to dollar thirty one. So with the quarters theory, I propose that prices do not move in a random and chaotic manner. But rather, I propose that prices move in an organized manner 
into organized patterns in attempts to complete the large quarters. They fluctuate. I, I propose the prices fluctuate within these 1,000 pip ranges in an organized attempt to complete the large quarters of 250 pips and that every significant price move when it comes to currency exchange rates occurs from one large quarter point targeting another large quarter point. And of course, within these smaller, these large quarters, we can also divide each large quarter of 250 pips in exactly 10 small quarters of 25 pips each. So in an organized manner, within the large quarters, uh, within the 1,000 pip ranges, the prices fluctuate between these large quarter points. And then within the actual large quarters, prices also fluctuate in an organized manner between these small quarter points in each one of the 250 pip ranges of a large quarter. The idea is to create a familiar environment for traders that is a uh, easy to recognize and constant. These are ranges that never ever change. In order for you to change these ranges, you have to change math, which could be quite difficult, I think. So what is the point here? I felt that uh, creating a familiar and predictable environment would be a lot more beneficial for a trader. It would be a lot more beneficial for a trader, in, for example, also to know that there is no chaos, that there is no randomness but rather organized moves that occur in familiar patterns that demonstrate themselves day in and day out with currency exchange rates. And some of the examples that I have give, uh, wanted to give you here in the slide is, for example, the dollar-yen exchange rate enters the 1,000 pip range above 90 yen, which is the 1,000 pip range, 10 yen range between 90 and 100 yen. Obviously, when we divide that into subunits called pips, that range would be equal to 1,000 pips. When we divide the 1,000 pip range into four equal parts of 250 pips, we'll get four large quarters of 250 pips each. And obviously, the points and the price levels that define these large quarters, I call them large quarter points, which, of course, when you have the major large quarter point, uh, the major whole number also coincides with a large quarter point. So in order for us to know that this is the major whole number, we also call this point a major large quarter point because we know that that is the level that is the end of a previous 1,000 pip range and the beginning of a new 1,000 pip range, a very, very important junction for the quarter theory methodology, because if you recall in a previous webinar, I also discussed what I call the 1,000 pip range transition in currency exchange rate. So in the example here, we have the 1,000 pip range between the major whole numbers 90 and 100 yen. You can see these organized price moves from one large quarter point targeting another large quarter point, which ultimately are led to the completion of the entire 1,000 pip range as prices from February of, uh, for example, 2009 in this particular slide move above 90 yen level and uh, ultimately go to complete the uh, entire 1,000 pip range to 100 yen in about two and a half months or so at that time. What is the completion of a large quarter? Well, obviously, we consider that every significant price move in a quarter theory methodology, every significant price move would begin at the familiar price point, which is going to be a large quarter point. And at the direction that this uh, price move will be likely to take us to would be to target the large quarter point, the next large quarter point, either above the one that initially signals the beginning of the move, or if we have a bearish 
trend development or a bearish trend, then we might target the large quarter point below. So what constitutes a completion of the large quarters? We know that the ranges are constant, never ever change. They're 250 pips always between two large quarter points. So as long as we get to see a move from one large quarter point targeting another large quarter point that reaches within 25 pips from the targeted large quarter point, we consider that price move as successfully completed. Now, why do we do that? The reason I explained previously also is that the market often disguises the large quarter points. For a trillion dollar a day market or whatever the recent volumes are with the foreign exchange market, we know that it's going to be practical, practically impossible for prices to stop exactly at a targeted large quarter point. In most instances, the targeted large quarter points will be either overshot by a few pips or prices will come short from the targeted large quarter point by a, a few pips. So what I do is I apply the small quarter range, which is 25 pips, and I designate the range of one small quarter or 25 pips from a targeted large quarter point to serve as the area that is going to show us whether or not prices have reached at least a number that falls within the vicinity of a targeted large quarter point. And if they have done that, if the vicinity within 25 pips from a targeted large quarter point is reached, then that will meet our requirement to constitute a successful completion of a large quarter. In this particular example, we get to see a price move that takes place from a large quarter point for the dollar Canadian dollar exchange rate, which is a dollar seventeen fifty. Prices move lower to target the large quarter point as a dollar and fifteen cents. Obviously, they do reach that level. They even overshoot a little bit below it, reach the overshoot area below the quarter uh, point at the dollar and fifteen cents. Obviously, we consider that as a successful completion of a large quarter. Here's another example of a successful completion of a large quarter. This is the euro dollar exchange rate moving from the large quarter point at the dollar thirty two fifty targeting the large quarter point above at the dollar thirty five cents. Obviously prices do not reach the large quarter point at the dollar thirty five cents exactly after the pip, and that is what not what we should require. As we said, it's going to be practically impossible for prices to Stop exactly at the dollar thirty-five cents, especially if there's some stop orders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We may not be able to see prices reaching the targeted large quarter point exactly after the pip. But as long as they do reach that area within twenty-five pips from a targeted large quarter point, we consider the large quarter as successfully completed. Jocelyn is uh, sending a message. Please refresh the screen. Are you guys not able to see my screen at all? If you're able to see the screen, let me know. If I need to change something, let me know so I make sure that you get to see everything. Well, it looks like Jocelyn, Jocelyn, if you can uh, refresh things. Yeah, if you can refresh things, it looks like it's uh, okay for the rest of the attendees. All right, great. Well, let's continue further. So um, here we have it. Okay. Are you guys not able to see the chart now? I'm switching over to the... All right. I'm getting a lot of questions as far as uh, the, these price moves are concerned, but let me continue with my presentation, and uh, later on you will find the answer to your question. So here's another example where prices do not complete a large quarter this time. Here's what we're seeing a move from the large quarter point to the dollar thirty two fifty in a euro dollar exchange rate. They move toward targeting the dollar and thirty-five cents level. 
but they do not reach that area of 25 fifths of the targeted large quarter point. And we then get to see a uh, reversal that takes prices back to the preceding large quarter point. So what does that mean? With the quarter theory methodology, I create a familiar environment, which gets to show traders where the price point is going to start at, what could be the next logical price point that we can target. And of course, just because prices begin to work on a large quarter, that doesn't necessarily mean that a large quarter is going to be successfully completed. But not to worry, because unsuccessful completion of the large quarter would be likely to take prices back to another familiar large quarter point, which is the preceding large quarter point. And that is what happens there in the example that I'm showing you right now. What do you guys mean by using another screen? Are you not able to... I, I mean, I'm seeing five people saying that they're able to see the screen, then two people or, or one person is saying that they're not able to. Uh, okay. Boyke, what other screen would you like me to use? <laughs> okay, don't worry, all good. All right, well, we're not going to worry about it then. I, I just want to make sure that everyone sees what I'm showing. Okay, and Jocelyn is now okay after re-logging. All right, perfect, perfect. Good to know. Okay, so with the quarter theory methodology, you have a familiar environment that gives you, in a way, even a roadmap, if you will. I provide you with the roadmap, and I give you the destination as well. You will know where the price moves, the initial significant price move begins, what could be the direction that that price move can take us to, and then ultimately, if a large quarter is not successfully completed, then we can also anticipate a reversal as a result of an unsuccessful completion of a large quarter that can take prices back to familiar price point, which is a large quarter point. So the idea is that a significant price move, move always begins from a large quarter point, and it always ends at the large quarter point. Whether the targeted large quarter point is reached, that would be the end of the significant price move. If the targeted large quarter point is not reached, then we can anticipate the move to take us back to the preceding large quarter point. Always begins with a large quarter point at the large quarter point and ends at a large quarter point. So that is the basics as far as the quarter steer methodology is concerned. What I wanted to talk about in a program today is something that I haven't talked about in previous webinars for FX3. And that is some of the trend recognition methodologies of the quarter steer, which by the way, for the lack of a better word, I call the quarter theory trend waves. Obviously, when you hear the name waves, one must definitely recall the classic Elliott waves theory. And we do owe a lot to Mr. Elliott as uh, traders. He was one of the first ones. How long ago was it? About 100 years ago? who suggested and proposed that uh, there is no chaos and randomness when it comes to prices, but rather that they move in organized patterns called waves. And he proposed that there is certain cycles as far as price moves are, are concerned. And, of course, when we consider trend development is concerned. So trends develop in cycles. Of waves, and this is the classic Elliott wave pattern, which shows us the uh, wave number one, two, which is the pullback after wave one. We got the wave number three, wave number four, wave number five. Basically, you have waves one, three, and five in the direction of the trend, 
waves number two and four, serving as a little price correction and pullbacks. And then after that three wave or five wave pattern comes to an end, we get to see a couple of uh, corrective waves, A and C, which uh, produce a little more significant price correction of that entire trend wave pattern. Now, in this case, obviously, this is a bullish trend wave pattern. Here is a real-life example with the exchange rate of the U.S. dollar and the Japanese yen. We take a look at the classic Elliott wave pattern. Wave number one takes prices higher. We got wave number two producing a little bit of a retracement, price correction. Wave number three taking the trend further to the upside. After wave number three ends, we got wave number four. And then after wave number four, wave number five comes in. And then we have these corrective waves A and C that uh, produce a little bit more of a price correction here. With the quarter theory methodology, what I have noticed, and uh, perhaps those of you who are using Elliott wave theory, which are very, very helpful, but one of the, lar the biggest problems for Elliott wave traders is that uh, they're not able to accurately count the number of trend waves, which obviously could be a big issue. Because if you are not counting the waves properly, let me take the previous slide. If you think that you're in a wave number one, which could be the beginning stage of the trend wave uh, progression in the, in the new trend wave cycle, but you're actually in trend wave number two, or uh, five rather, then you might be at the end of the cycle thinking that you're at the beginning of the cycle. Obviously, you can become a victim of this price correction that could fall after that, after the cycle ends. So that is why it is imperative for an Elliott wave trader to be able to properly count the waves so that you can recognize exactly what stage of the trend progression you're going to be in. And you were considering that particular trading opportunity when you want to jump in a trade. So what I decided to do is I decided to minimize the number of waves. So with the quarter series trend waves, I actually, thinking about trend progression, et cetera, et cetera, I based the, obviously, the foundation of the quarter series trend waves on Elliott wave waves. But what I decided to do is to minimize the number of waves. I figured if we have to count five waves, waves, and uh, especially when we have to, as Mr. Elliott have given a number to these price corrections, then what I decided to do is actually not consider the price corrections, wave number two and four, for example, in a class uh, Elliott wave example and pattern. I decided to, instead of given a, a number, to actually give them a name so that the uh, traders are more familiar with uh, and, and help with the proper wave count and so the traders can also visualize and understand better what these waves number two and four actually are. Because here's my thought. Waves number one, three, and five in a classic Elliott wave pattern are the actual trend waves in the same direction of the trend. So they, every new wave, progresses the trend further. It takes the trend further. But on the other hand, waves number two and four are actual regressive waves. Instead of progressing the trend further, they actually regress it. So I actually call them, with the quarter theory trend waves methodology, I call these price corrections. And I give them a num number also so that they can signify exactly which particular trend wave <laughs> these corrections are following. For example, after the first wave, correction number one is labeled C1, for example, which stands for correction one. That tells us that it follows the first wave. Correction number two tells us that it follows the second wave. Correction number three 
tells us that it, that it follows the third wave. I also give the actual waves a number. The first trend wave, <clears throat> I call the reversal trigger wave. The reason why I call it the reversal trigger wave is because this is the kind of a wave that is going to be very helpful for us traders to be able to recognize exactly when a trend cycle begins and when a previous one ends. The reversal trigger waves are the ones that always will tell us and signal the end of a previous trend wave cycle and the beginning of a new one. So they can also, if a previous trend wave cycle, for example, is a bearish trend wave cycle and a bullish reversal trigger wave begins, then obviously it would be also a, tri a uh, potential trigger for a trend reversal of a bearish trend as an attempt to turn a bearish trend into a bullish one. Now, if a reversal trigger wave, which is followed by a price correction, is after that followed by another second wave, trend wave, I call that second wave the progressive wave. The reason why I've chosen that name is because that is the wave that actually confirms the development of an actual cycle, that we don't just have one reversal trigger wave, that that trigger of a possible reversal of a new trend wave cycle is now being followed by a second wave that would be expected to progress the trend further. To progress basically what has already began with the reversal trigger wave number one. Then after the progressive wave comes to an end, we have correction number two following it, and then we have what I call the potential conclusive wave. Because in a classic Elliott wave pattern, this is the equivalent conclusive wave number three in a quarter theory trend waves methodology is equal to wave number five in a classic Elliott wave cycle, which as we know in a classic cycle, <coughs> wave number five is followed by a price correction and uh, not only a price correction, but actual corrective couple of trend waves in the opposite direction. So that is why I give the third wave the name the conclusive wave. But here is the difference between the classic Elliott wave pattern and cycle and the quarter theory trend wave cycle. The conclusive wave number three is not followed by wave A, B, and C, but rather simply by a correction number three, which is labeled for the wave that it follows. And why do I do that? Here is why. Have you actually asked yourself, in a perfect world, obviously, these patterns will occur all the time. Unfortunately, however, prices do not always move in that fashion. In a perfect world, a five classic bullish wave cycle in the LA wave theory would be followed by these corrective waves A, B, and C in the opposite direction. However, what happens if in real life situations we actually get to see, after wave number five and wave A, what is expected to be that wave B actually continuing further and breaking above the high of wave five. What happens then? What is an Elliott wave to do? Well, some of you will say, silly you, of course. That would mean that we might have the so-called complex Elliott wave pattern. Meaning that, you know what? Wave number five could potentially consist of three smaller subwaves. Yes, absolutely. I agree with that. There could be a possibility for that. In this particular example, we have the so-called complex Elliott wave pattern, where actual waves consist of three smaller subwaves. So with the previous slide, if I'm scratching my head and I'm wondering, okay, what happens if wave number five 
actually sees prices continue higher rather than going through these corrective bearish trend waves, of course, an Elliott wave trader could anticipate the development of potential complex Elliott wave pattern where wave number five consists of a three smaller subwaves. Okay, so that's a possibility. But let's take a look at this example here. Here we have the dollar Canadian dollar currency pair. And we can see prices beginning a trend wave pattern in a cycle of wave one, two, three, four. Wave number five here, looks like we got a little pullback after it. Oh, we got another move, another move. Okay, maybe we can count this as a complex wave number five consisting of three smaller subwaves. But even after these three smaller subwaves are done, then we ought to see that corrective trend wave cycle, right? Of waves A, B, and C. But in this particular example, we do not see that. Instead, prices continue to move lower and lower. So what is an Elliott wave trader to do? Even after considering that we may have, may have had that wave number five consisting of three smaller sub waves. What's an Elliott wave trader to do? This is where a lot of Elliott wave traders get very confused. And this is where the count of trend waves goes completely out the window. And there's a familiar saying to a lot of you, obviously, who have experience with Elliott waves that if you ask, if you put Elliott wave traders, a bunch of Elliott wave traders in a room, they will always disagree on a wave count. So that is the biggest issue for, for Elliott wave traders. And that is one of the examples that I wanted to share with you that causes this confusion. So here's what I did with the quarters theory trend wave methodology. I decided not to limit the number of trend waves in a pattern. And I also decided to completely eliminate any type of so-called complex trend waves or trend waves that could consist of three smaller trend waves. This simplifies the wave count. And here's how I would read this trend wave cycle applying the methodology of the quarters theory trend waves, my version of the classic Elliott wave scale. I would consider this move here as a couple of bullish waves, obviously, to the upside. But when these laws here are broken, then we will have a confirmation that a reversal trigger wave number one, which is a bearish reversal trigger wave has occurred, which has ended the previous cycle and has now signaled the beginning of a new bearish trend wave cycle. And we will get confirmation that this cycle continues forward and further if, obviously, the reversal trigger bearish wave, number one, is then followed by a second progressive wave to the downside, which in this example, that happened. We get the second bearish trend wave. And then after the price correction following the second wave, we get a third bearish wave. And instead of calling this cycle here a complex one, we give if each one of these price moves to the downside and a price correction another wave number. Wave number three, wave number four, wave number five, wave number six, and wave number seven. So the idea is, with the quarter theory trend waves methodology, for us not to limit the number of waves, but rather allow the market to decide exactly how many trend waves the market wants to produce. And we keep an open mind. We do not limit the number of trend waves. Each wave that follows more than three waves cycle I named the consecutive wave. It's a wave that follows the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, 
the seventh. And if the market decides to go with 10 waves, so be it. If we have a strong trend, obviously, <clears throat> we can see these, what I call also, extended trend wave cycles. Any cycle that lasts for more than three waves, I call an extended trend wave cycle. And if a cycle consists of more than four waves, then we would call it overextended trend wave cycle, which obviously could also help a trader recognize overbought or oversold conditions. By the time you reach, by the time you reach uh, five, six, seven consecutive waves, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that uh, that trend might be a bit extended already. So here's an example once again, of what the quarter theory trend wave cycle looks like. We got a previous, previous bearish trend wave cycle, comes to an end with a reversal trigger wave. Once again, it's imperative for you to be able to properly recognize these reversal trigger waves because they're going to be the first ones in a cycle. They always end a previous cycle. They always start potential new cycles. When a trader recognizes a reversal trigger wave, that is also going to be the point when the wave count begins. So the very, very crucial trend waves to help you with the proper wave count. So after a bearish trend wave cycle, we get a reversal trigger bullish trend wave followed by correction number one. Then we have a progressive bullish wave number two followed by correction number two. We have a conclusive wave number three, followed by correction number three. Then wave three high is broken after the correction, and we have a consecutive wave number four. Here is the most recent example of a great little quarter theory trend wave cycle that has been lasting pretty much on the euro dollar daily chart since, um, what is it? Beginning of, end of June, beginning of July. Let's start the count here. Obviously we have a strong bearish trend wave cycle that takes place previously. We have some lows being established there. Those are the uh, four-year lows for the euro dollar pair, obviously. It's uh, a little bit below dollar nineteen cents, if you recall, dollar eighteen seventy-five. What normally we would anticipate, and again, count the number of waves here. We have one, two, three, four. It was actually a five or six wave cycle before that. But it, it is important to note that this cycle, this previously strong bearish trend wave cycle, came to an end with a reversal trigger bullish wave number one. The reason why that happened is because you will see this candle here during a price correction. That high was at dollar twenty four fifty two, where this high here during this move to the upside was a dollar twenty four sixty six. Doesn't look like that much higher, but technically speaking it was how many pips? Fourteen pips higher. So that signal at that point to us that this was a bullish reversal trigger wave number one which ended the previously strong bearish trend wave cycle. What do we expect when a trend wave comes to an end? Obviously, a price correction that's going to follow it. After the bullish reversal trigger wave number one came to an end, we had a correction, number one following. When the correction that follows ends, traders can anticipate the development of a another second bullish trend wave. But in this particular example with the euro dollar recent development, the second bullish wave was not able to break above the high of the first wave and continue the bullish trend wave cycle. 
Once again, ladies and gentlemen, the basic definition of an uptrend is higher highs and higher lows. You got to see at least higher highs in order for a bullish trend wave cycle to continue and for new bullish trend waves to be successful. It has to always produce at least a higher high than a previous bullish wave. That did not happen. You will know this double top here, two identical highs in these two days at around dollar twenty three ninety four, and then uh, the following day dollar twenty three ninety six within two pips from each other. The number, of course, here to break above was the high of the first bullish wave at the dollar twenty four sixty six. So obviously, during the second bullish wave, prices have failed to produce a higher high than a dollar twenty four sixty six. So what is the trader to anticipate when a trend wave fails? As I explain in my book, The Quarter Theory, the main consequence of a trend wave failure is the development, in most instances, of a reversal trigger wave in the opposite direction. Traders realize that the previous bullish trend wave cycle is failing, and there's an attempt for to trigger a reversal which materializes in most instances with the development of a reversal trigger bearish trend wave in the opposite direction. In this case with the euro dollar pair, we had the second bullish trend wave failing being followed immediately in the days after that by a bearish reversal trigger wave number one. Now, when the bearish reversal trigger wave number one came to an end, we can anticipate that a price correction is going to follow it. However, the price correction of this bearish trend wave that started from the highs here to the lows there was actually much larger than the 100% Fibonacci retracement levels of that wave. So what does that mean? <clears throat> that means that the correction <clears throat> following the bearish reversal trigger wave number one, has actually exceeded the 100% retracement level or the previous highs there. And what does that mean? When these highs are broken, then we have the development of a reversal trigger bullish wave. Basically what has happened is, <clears throat> as I also explained in my book, we have seen the second reason as to why reversal trigger waves develop. The first one we said was a trend wave failure. As a result of a trend wave failure, in most instances, we anticipate the development of a reversal trigger wave in the opposite direction. The second reason why these reversal trigger waves occur is when a price correction following a trend wave exceeds the 100% retracement and actually becomes a reversal trigger wave in the opposite direction. That was the scenario that we saw with these developments there. This is, by the way, a daily chart of the euro dollar pair. So with that break above previous highs, with the correction following reversal trigger bearish wave number one, we obviously see that there, would, there is not going to be a follow-up bearish trend wave to the first bearish wave. Instead, we got to see a reversal trigger bullish wave establishing itself, which signals the end of a previous pattern and cycles and the beginning of a new bullish trend wave cycle. As you can see here, the bullish reversal trigger wave is then followed by lasts for a significant amount of time. It lasts for about seven days or so. It's followed by correction number one. Then after the correction number one, prices have uh, moved higher and a progressive wave number, bullish progressive number, wave number two has occurred. Prices have continued to climb higher and higher. Then the correction number two occurs after the end of the second bullish wave. After the correction number two is over with, we get to see the uh, third bullish wave followed by correction number three, and then most recently, a bullish fourth bullish trend wave on a daily chart of the euro dollar pair. This is a very strong bullish trend wave sequence 
of four consecutive bullish waves. Very strong bullish trend wave signals for the euro dollar pair. However, you will note here that the lows of correction number three were actually broken on this day. And this was the day when we actually knew that that strong bullish trend wave sequence of four consecutive waves may be coming to a period of a more significant price correction, which would be obviously a welcome price correction, considering that we had an extended bullish trend wave sequence. We knew that it's only a matter of time before a more significant price correction occurs. How do we know that the price correction starts? When the correction following the first, uh, the fourth bullish wave exceeds the 100% retracement level and breaks below the low of correction number three, which happened on this day, which was, what, what, what day was that? Let me see. That was August 10th. On August 10th, prices have reached a low at the dollar 30.73, which is a lower low then the law of correction number three at the dollar thirty one eighteen. That is when we knew that we once again have seen the development of a bearish reversal trigger wave that ended the strong four bullish trend wave cycle, and we got to see an opportunity for the U.S. dollar to correct some of its losses versus the euro during that uh, month or so of uh, four bullish trend wave cycle and over 1,200 pips, by the way, of gains, or approximately at least 1,200 pips of gains for the euro against the US dollar during the sequence of four bullish trend waves. Obviously, the reversal trigger wave here is not going to necessarily reverse the previously established bullish trend. But it provides an opportunity for prices to go through a more significant price correction. Now I want you, and I'm running out of time, but I want you guys to pay close attention to how beautifully, in this particular example with the euro dollar pair, how beautifully these, each one of these trend waves in a cycle has coincided with the actual large quarters of the quarters theory. Let me show you what I mean. Take a look at reversal trigger bullish wave number one and take a look at the price or the vicinity of the price point that it started from. That you will know that that was the area of a dollar twenty two fifty large quarter point. When a bullish trend wave cycle starts, the bullish trend wave in the next two days goes to complete the entire large quarter of two hundred and fifty pips so targeting the large quarter point at the dollar twenty five. But because the bullish trend wave continues even further, then yet another large quarter of 250 pips is completed after that, targeting the area of dollar twenty-seven fifty large quarter point. Then during the price correction, following correction, uh, following the bullish trend wave number one, we got to see the retracement and the price correction taking prices again to a familiar price level, where to? The preceding large quarter point, which in this case was dollar and twenty-five cents level. After prices found support around the dollar twenty-five cents, we anticipated the beginning of a second bullish trend wave, the progressive one that ought to progress that bullish trend wave cycle further. And when a trader uses the methodologies of the quarter theory, then we will know what the destination of that bullish wave might actually be. If you're guessing. From dollar twenty-five cents large quarter point, targeting the large quarter point above at the dollar twenty-seven fifty, then you are guessing absolutely correctly. Moreover, after completing the large quarter between dollar twenty-five and the dollar twenty-seven fifty, the bullish trend wave began even further and became even stronger, with prices continuing forward to guess where? Well, that's not a major shocker, I hope, for those of you following the methodologies of the quarter theory. Targeting the major large quarter point this time with a dollar and thirty cents. Completing the large quarters between dollar twenty five to dollar twenty seven fifty and then dollar twenty seven fifty to dollar and thirty cents. After the bullish trend wave finds resistance around the dollar thirty cents major large quarter point, 
prices go through a period of a price correction, and during the price correction, surprise, surprise, prices pull back. Where to? The preceding large quarter point at the dollar twenty seven fifty, and so forth, and so forth. I'm running out of time. Can't go through any more details now. But if you would like to learn more about the quarter's theory and the quarter's theory methodologies, you can simply visit my website, allthingsforex.com. I recently launched a new training program for those of you interested in learning the quarter's theory methodologies, which I call All Things Forex Plus. You can also listen to my daily All Things Forex broadcast, <clears throat> and you can also do that by visiting All Things Forex. Dot com. The broadcast takes place Monday through Friday, 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, you can also, by the way, listen to the broadcast on fx3.com. It is published there as well. I'd like to thank you all for your participation today. Do you have any questions? I don't know if we have a lot of time, but if you don't have any questions, we'll wrap it up and we will let the presenter who follows to uh, start his presentation and preparation. Any questions? All right, great. Well, with that said, I'd like to thank our friends at fxstreet.com. And uh, thank you all very much for attending today. I'm looking forward to seeing you at uh, my website, www.allthingsforex.com, or seeing you again at some of the upcoming webinars here for our friends at FX3. Thank you very much, everybody, and happy trading.